trust in Jesus and this is what he said he said be not afraid be strong and have courage and be not dismayed for I have sent shadow of death. You've got to lift up your eyes and look to the Lord. You've got to trust in Jesus and this is what he said. He said, be not afraid. Watches me. 
Take your seats. Good evening to all that are in here and all that are logged on out there. This is the Children of the Free Church Ministry. My name is Charles Garcia. I'm the teaching pastor or pastoring teacher, if you will. Otherwise, to some old timers known as Buddy Garcia. We gather here live every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time for church. The archives of the teaching are available on our site, childrenofthefree.com. I believe some of them are available on YouTube, aren't they? All of them are available on YouTube. And Tune in. You're invited to tune in. Tune in regularly. Regulars, you better tune in regularly. And get your messages into me in response to the teaching. Speaking of messages, last week, after going to the table of the Lord and teaching on communion service, which I think was a a pretty good service. Yes, sir. Remarkable. <coughs> I made an important, I think, God directed speech. And afterwards, I made a statement, question, to the congregation if you agree with me, then message me. I fully expected the messages to flood the site. Not one single message came in all week long. Now, this is a first. I've never had an entire week go by that messages didn't come in or a message didn't come in. But Satan always overplays his hand. I know what's going on here and why. If you heard last week's message, you better stand up and be counted and get your message into me tonight. Yes, sir. If you didn't hear the message, check the archives, listen to it, and then respond. If you're watching this message, not live like we are now, on a rerun, so to speak, then you go back and listen to the prior week's message and respond. Understood? Yes, sir. Turn in the Old Testament to the book of Daniel. Daniel is the last of what they call the major prophets. It's after Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, before the minor prophets. And it's been a long time since we've been here, two or three years or so, maybe longer. But at that time, we taught verse by verse through the entire book of Daniel. Four years, I guess, I've, somebody's given me a signal. Been a long time. Tonight, we're going to read teach and point out the first and second chapters of Daniel. We're going to set the stage and lay the groundwork 
for the next phase. And if God allows, and as He directs, we're then going to start leapfrogging through Daniel as it applies to future <coughs> and end times coming. I guess I should join you there. Give me a show of hands when you're there. The book of Daniel. We're going to start out at the beginning. Like I said, we're going to be reading, teaching, and pointing out things in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Starts out by saying, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, so this is a king of the Jewish part of the Hebrews, or the Jewish part of the Israelite group. And to start again, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. That's pretty straightforward. The Babylonian king and the Babylonians came up to Jerusalem, besieged it. I have to pause with a little twinkle in my eye because when I say Nebuchadnezzar, I remember my mentor, Dr. Scott, used to say when they used to, when they were kids and used to razz the Bible, they used to say, Nebuk had a razor. <laughs> anyway, Nebuk had a razor. Nebuchadnezzar. Second verse, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim. Now we taught not too long ago that God is a shield. Remember that teaching? And nothing can get by that shield unless he decides to move it out of the way and let something come by. And he does do that to try you and to test you and sometimes to show you off. Listen. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, unto his, Nebuchadnezzar's hand. So God took that shield away and he gave Jehoiakim over to the Babylonians and part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried, he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried into the land of Shinar. Shinar is Egypt, in case you don't know that. Carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure of his God. And this is what is usually done and often done, particularly in the olden days, when you conquer, you take over, you take treasure, or what they call booty, and you take it and you put it in your treasury and you get the warriors at the other side and you parade them in chains and look what we caught here and other things which you're going to see now but I'm going to tell you here what we're going to be showing in this first part of Daniel comes directly from Romans 8 I believe where the true translation is where it says that God enters into all things to work his good to them who are the called according to his purposes. That sound familiar? Yes. Well, it may not be literally the way you know it in your King James, but that's the literal translation of what's being said there. And so we're going to show you God entering in in the Old Testament to work his good to set up Daniel to prophesy. Third verse, and the king, still Nebuchadnezzar, the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, these are the Jewish children of the Israelites, certain of the children of Israel, and in those certain children of the king's seed and of the princes. So we're talking about the high, high echelon, the royalty, so to speak. King Nebuchadnezzar is telling him to do that. This is another thing that conquerors did. In order to really conquer you, they take over your kids and train them, and then they take over. It says, Certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Fourth verse, Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge. And we're talking about the valedictorians. We're talking about the best of the best. He's telling Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, these are the kids he once brought in. 
skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and understanding science. Well, I thought science hadn't been invented yet. But anyway, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, they got the wherewithal to be in, in the king's presence, and whom they might, they, the, the Babylonians, might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Same thing, Babylonians. So that's what they're trying to do, is a selection process. And the king appointed them, these children that he told the kind he wants, a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, that the, the king drank. And I want to pause here just to tell you, this meat and wine are things that the Babylonians offered to their gods. It's not spoiled, there's nothing wrong with it, but it was dedicated to their gods. And Nebuchadnezzar is saying he wants them to eat this meat and to drink this wine, so nourishing them three years. Now you might pass over that if you haven't been taught true biblical numerology and God's scripture here. Three means what? Divine manifestation. You can cough into your handkerchief. You don't need to step out. Get yourself a drink of water. So he's going to nourish them, these selected ones, best of the best, three years. That at the end thereof, of the three years, they might stand before the king. So he selected them. He's preparing them for three years. And then they're going to come into the Babylonian king's presence. Six verse. Now among these, these children that we're talking about, the children of Judah, <coughs> that's the Jewish portion of the Hebrews, among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names Again, when conquering, they give their own names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar. Now, I don't want you to get mixed up. Later on in this very book, there's going to be a Belshazzar king. This is Belteshazzar, Daniel. Okay, He's been given the name Belteshazzar. And to Hananiah was given the name Shadrach. And to Mishael was given the name Meshach. Well, at least that one's a little close, Mishael and Meshach. The other ones are quite different. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, these are the ones that are being prepared, remember? And the eighth verse says, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Now, if I hadn't told you what I just told you, you would, that would have no meaning to you. You wouldn't understand why is he defiling himself. Because it was stuff that was offered to their gods. That's defiling themselves. Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now something is going to be said here parenthetically. The ninth verse is a parenthesis. And you're going to watch here God entering in. Ninth verse says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And that's who Daniel went to to say, don't, please don't let me defile myself with this order. God's already been there. He already entered in and set the stage. God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why he sh should he see your face worse liking than the children which are of your sort, so of the other group, if they're the only ones that don't defile themselves, so to speak, the eunuch is afraid there's going to be a difference as they come through this. Then said Daniel, and he told to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they say to this guy that's over them, prove thy servants, check us out. Prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat, 
and water to drink. So they're going to refuse the kings or not have the kings meat and wine. Going to have pulse. Now there's some confusion and disagreement in the sources if you check and for try to find out what pulse is. The majority of the opinion is that this is seeds, grains, or it could be legumes like lentils or beans or something like that. So I'm, I'm saying here, and I put in the part margin there, he wants soul food. He's going to say, you give us soul food. Don't give us that steak and wine. He said, give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances, the way they look, their faces, be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou, as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. Ten is the number of human responsibility, by the way. And at the end of ten days, their countenances, listen to this, appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. I don't think this has to do with the king's steaks and soul food like I was saying. I don't think it has to do with a healthier way of eating. God is doing what God is doing here. He's honoring them, not defiling themselves is what he's doing and enabling them. Again, we'll read that. At the end of ten days, her countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse, just like they agreed, so he's going to do it. As for these four children, now we named them, these four children, what's four stand for in biblical numerology? Covering the whole earth. Okay. And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. This is important. So why you highlight that, circle it or whatever. I told you we were laying the groundwork to show how God set the stage and enabled him to be able to prophesy. Well, he had understanding in all visions and dreams. You're going to see why. Now at the end of the days the king had said he would bring them in. How long was that? He said, the end of the days, three years. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Okay, so he's got them this special knowledge. He's put them on a diet so they don't have to defile themselves. And after all is said and done, there's none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them not just better, ten times better, not than just the other children, than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Circle those alls. Talk about overplaying your hand. Now, Daniel and his cohorts here, and all the rest of the children, are POWs. They're prisoners of war, right? Yes. They're people who are nation was conquered, they were taken over, they were taken away, they're POWs. 21st verse says, And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So he was there all the way from Nebuchadnezzar all the way to the first year of Cyrus. Seventy years. He was seventy years, he was a POW. That's jumping up to that, that conclusion. Let's jump back again. Chapter 2. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. He couldn't sleep. And the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers 
and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. So he's getting all the mediums, Long Island medium, all those people. He's bringing them all in, the mediums and the psychics, right? For to show the king his dreams. So they came, and they stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I've dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. I don't know why they're pointing that out, but Syriac is, is a dialect of Aramaic. Then spake the Chaldeans unto the king in Syriac. O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we'll show thee the interpretation. Now, these are all the psychics and Long Island mediums and all those people there. And the king answered, and he said to the Chaldeans, The thing's gone from me. I, I don't remember it. But kings are kings. And the king says, If you will not make known to me the dream, with the interpretation, thereof ye shall be cut into pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Now, really, if you do believe in psychic ability and medium ability, shouldn't they be able to tell him what the dream was? Okay. So the king's not as dumb as he looks. He's saying, the thing is gone for me. If he will not make known to me the dream with, with the interpretation, he's going he's gonna to get him. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honors. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Second time. Second time, they answered again. So circle that. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we'll show thee the interpretation of it. The king answered and he said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time. What does that mean? You're stalling, right? He's telling him, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. You're stalling. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. you for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. You're stalling, trying to make something up. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Psychics, mediums he's talking to, magicians, astrologers, sorcerers. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There's not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asketh such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it's a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the, the king, except the gods. Remember that. Circle that. Except the gods. Those dwelling not with the flesh. So nobody can tell you that except somebody who is a god and they're not down here. Twelfth verse, for this cause the king was angry, I should say, and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Okay. You might first say good, but realize who else is there with the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth, and the wise men that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. They're counted among the wise men. God entering in to enable Satan entering in to try and kill Daniel. He's slated for death right here, right now. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which had gone, no, with wisdom, to the king's guard, which had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said unto Arioch, the king's captain, why is the, the decree so hasty from the king? What's the rush? That Arioch made the thing known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and desired of the king that he should give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house, his guys, and made the thing known to Hananiah, 
Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Now, first of all, I want you to understand and realize we just recently taught about putting yourself at risk, didn't we? When they came to the Red Sea, when Joshua and them came to the River Jordan at flood stage, they had to step in that river before God parted it. Well, Daniel already got word out. Let him interpret the dream. Now listen. 18 first, that they, him and his guys, would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. 19th verse, then. Circle that. So he put himself at risk first. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. After they put themselves at risk in faith, then went to God, then he gave them the vision. And for the next two or three verses, and we'll read them because God deserves it, Daniel's blessing his God. Daniel answered in the 20th verse and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings, and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge unto them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what's in the darkness. Let's, hey, let's claim that as a promise. God knoweth what's in the darkness. And the light dwelleth with him. 23rd verse, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Credit where credit's due, right? Therefore Daniel went unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said it thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Eric brought him, brought Daniel before the king. He did it in haste. And said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered, said unto Daniel, whose name, Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and he said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. They said, but he, excuse me, but there is, Daniel speaking, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Remember, they said themselves, nobody could tell you except the gods. Well, Thou sayest, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Okay, you want to circle those. Important. This is part of getting into what Daniel is going to be bringing forth for us to know and carry forth into revelation and into our lives of faith. What shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came unto the mi thy mind upon thy bed, and should come pass what should come pass hereafter. We're talking future. And he that revealeth secrets, God, maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. 31st verse. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This is the dream. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. It doesn't mean it was awful. It means it filled you with terror. It was terrible. 
The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs, really sides, of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest until that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together, became like shaft of the summer's threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone, circle that stone, circle that stone the first time up in the 34th verse, that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Now this vision that he, that Nebuchadnezzar sees, saw, Daniel's describing, and is going to be interpreting, is about events and kingdoms that are in Daniel's future at this time that we're reading this. Not yet happened, but our past, as we learn this. And it becomes proof of prophecy. We were taught by Dr. Scott that the proof of a prophet is that what he says comes true. All right. This is Daniel's future, our past. Part of it. And part of the images as we go along fall into that category. This stone that they're talking about, stone cut without hands, stone that smote all this image. We're talking about in this image that was made out of different metals so to speak, in different substances. We are also talking about kingdoms. And I'll just tell you right now what they are as we get into the interpretation here. Gold stands for Babylon. The head was gold, Babylon. The breast and the arms were of silver. That stands for the kingdom of Medo-Persia, or the Medo-Persians, the Medes and the Persians together. The belly and the thighs or sides were made of brass. That stands for the Grecian kingdom, or the Greeks. And his legs of iron stands for the Roman Empire. Okay, are you following? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And these all happen to be kingdoms that oppressed or were over God's chosen people through history. It goes on to say his legs of iron, Roman, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Remember? And then it says, Thou sawest until that stone that was cut without hand smote the image. You're going to see references in here and a couple of more to stone and that stone and the stone kingdom, and they're going to make it clear that they're talking about a kingdom. And in scripture, you'll find references to the capstone, and the cornerstone, and the chief cornerstone, and the stone that was rejected. We're referring to Christ's kingdom, when we say the stone kingdom. Indeed, in the Great Pyramid in Egypt, and I don't want to sidebar too much here, was built intentionally with an error in it so that the top would not fit. And in all of structures, there's only one that has a chief cornerstone, and that is a pyramid. And that stone was rejected by the builders of the pyramid because it would not fit. Christ. Let's move on. That stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For God, the God of heaven, hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee rulers over them all. Thou art this head of gold. 
and after thee there shall rise another kingdom. So now you see we're talking about kingdoms. Rose another kingdom. Now this time it doesn't say of silver, but that's the silver kingdom. Inferior to thee. So after Babylon came on the scene, Medo-Persia. They came and took everything over and became the, the big frog in a small pond. Inferior to thee. And another third kingdom of brass, the Grecian kingdom, which shall bear rule over all the earth. That's the same kingdom that Alexander the Great was the head of. And he conquered the whole known world. Well, and he was 19 years old or 26 or something. He was just a strapping youngster. And it says, and the fourth kingdom, so now we know, we know now, right? We're talking about kingdoms here. Nothing else. Kingdom and fear, another current, a third kingdom, a fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. And that's the Roman Empire. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. You saw the feet. 41st verse. Feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with clay. So it's going to be strong, but not as strong as solid iron. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so that the kingdom, this kingdom we're talking about, shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle this other kingdom themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. They're not going to stick together, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now they're describing a ten-toed kingdom that's going to come in the last days. And there's a lot of speculation as to who this ten-toed kingdom is going to be or who it's going to be made up of. Most people and most authorities agree it has something to do with some variation of the um, European Union. Okay? File that. And in the days of these kings, not the Babylonian and all those, these ten-toed kings, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. The stone kingdom. Christ's kingdom. The last one. 45, verse 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So Daniel, done. Verse 46. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. He's being honored. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel requested his, his response of the king that he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his guys, over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So he was up the top with the king. Much like when Joseph was down in Egypt with Pharaoh. Most people don't realize that he ruled with Pharaoh until a Pharaoh came along that knew not Joseph. The way things, God does things is absolutely astounding. Here he's got Daniel, a captive nation's offspring. And now he's in charge of see, all the wise men and of Babylon and his cohorts are in charge of all this and Daniel's up there with the king.
Now, folks, I tell you, and I'm telling you now, and I need to tell you, we are in the time of the Ten-Toed Kingdom. Like I said before, some variation, some mix of the European Union. There's some argument over it. Some people say, well, Greek's not, Greece is not in it. Greece has to be in it. Or Greece is not Some mix of the European Union or some conglomeration and restoration of the ancient Holy Roman Empire is going to be this ten-toed kingdom and it is forming and it exists now. What's the next kingdom? Stone. That's right. The stone kingdom is the next kingdom. And before that's set up and destroys these other ten, we'll be gone, thanks be to God. And that's my message tonight. <laughs> and it's offering time. Don't give unless you've been taught, and I believe you've just been taught. So do the right thing. Like Bette Midler says, God is watching you. <laughs> For the offertory, we're going to have. I like ain't that the truth? When I said, and I kind of cut that short. But we can't be here when Christ's kingdom is wiping out all these ten toed kingdom and setting its, itself up. God's going to move us out of the way before things get too bad. But if that's the next kingdom and we got to go before, what does that tell you? Something good's about to happen. I just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised he would open all of heaven. And brother, it could happen any day. I have never been so thrilled about tomorrow. Sunshine always breaking through skies of gray. I just feel like something good is about to happen. Child of God, it really makes no difference. Cause things are getting better either way. I have never been so thrilled about tomorrow. Sunshine always breaking through skies of gray. I just feel like have much to add to tonight's message except to remind you what I said early on that we now God willing and God directing are going to start leapfrogging through Daniel to the series of visions we went through verse by verse we taught about the lion's den we taught about the fiery furnace we're going to not teach those this time we're going to go to the images and the signs and signals of the last kingdoms and the Antichrist and God's war in heaven and all those things are going to give meaning when we dive into it God willing and revelation so tune in next week get your messages to me about tonight's teaching stand up and be counted about last week's speech and keep on walking in faith well I searched and I searched for a road that led to glory. I wondered if I'd ever find my way. I was so dismayed for the road it seemed so lonely. But then I heard a voice within me say, you've got to keep on walking. Keep right on walking. Walking
Walk.